Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, Marie, I'm going to ask you to monitor the chat box. Um, if there are questions that we might try to take them, um, if time permits. And I'd like to get started. My name is Bill Malm. I'm VP for Revenue Transformation here at Health Catalyst Vitalware. And this is the first in a four part series on overlooked items and charge uh, capture. Um, we have a disclaimer is that this presentation is current as of today. Um, information is intended for educational purposes and not for business decisions. And CMS and regulatory rules change constantly. And therefore that would, uh, this is current today. Um, CPT codes are all copyrighted and trademarked by the American, Hos American Medical Association. Rev codes that are mentioned in here are copyrighted by the American Hospital Association, cannot be distributed without their express consent. So today we're going to have a go at uh, charge capture. Well, we're, first of all, we're going to start with the whole process, you know, just a high level overview. Identify points um, in the process that can result in leakage, high volume items of leakage, high cost items of leakage, and if software is an appropriate uh, method of handling some of these issues. Our objectives, which you'll need for today, uh, for your CEUs is understand the charge capture process, be able to identify charge leakage at its root cause, state two areas of leakage, and understand supply coding implications. So as we start with charge capture, <clears throat> here's a flow chart of charge capture. And I want to point out that if we look at this, if we fail in this category, none of the rest of it the charge capture or the billing process actually matters. So we definitely want to focus on that. As we move through it, we see that patient access is the start. Uh, you get the documentation, charges are entered, there are edits placed in place, and they go over to the scrubber for payment. So when we start, we're going to start with patient access. So patient access can make or break a claim, to be honest. Uh, key elements that can cause a claim to fail are lack of eligibility, lack of authorization for the service or incomplete authorization and failed demographics. And this, this is the concern part. 25, as, as high as 25%, according to a revenue cycle intelligence article, says that one in four claims will fail um, because of the wrong demographics incomplete or erroneous demographics. So uh, this is a big cause for concern. And as we move forward, we're gonna see that uh, this has to be training for patient access. When I, in the back in the day, when I was uh, a VP in the hospital, um, we didn't put a lot of effort on patient access. They were just there to, to, to register the patient. And we put the emphasis on patient financial services to fix the claim. Now we're realizing more and more with the complicated system, can't fix the claim if patient access isn't given the resources and time to do it. They have to be continuously reviewed and retrained. This is actually a high turnover area, and therefore the models for retention are very important. We want to look at the technology for eligibility. Many of your provider or payers will have their own technology. So while maybe Epic or Cerner or Meditech, they have integrated eligibility as a, a component of the registration module. Other groups like Blue Cross or Medicaid, they may have a whole separate uh, process module that you have to go to. And that gets very confusing and time consuming for people. Uh, using analytics to tie denials to root cause is very important. I know at Health Catalyst, we have revenue Cycle Explorer, it looks at denials and it ties you down right to the issue in the area. Each failure identified has to be addressed as a systematic root cause. While predominantly a Medicare action, medical necessity still is a huge failure for the registration process. Um, it gets its derivatives from the Social Security Act. Uh, section 1862, and this pretty much drives all payment for Medicare, notwithstanding any other provision, expenses incurred for items and services 
uh, have to have reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of an illness, injury, or improving a malformed body member. So people who go in for a wellness physical without symptoms, as a general rule, Medicare only pays those under the wellness program. So a lot of, a lot of uh, commercial pales will pay it, but the rule of thumb has been and will continue to be, if you don't have signs and symptoms, likely not going to be covered and reimbursed. When that happens, you need to get an ABN for, uh, for Medicare. This does not apply to other payers. Other payers have medical necessity rules. And you have to get the ABN prior to the provision of the service. So if you've already provided the service, the patient's deemed to be under distress if you ask them for it then. So they have always made it very clear it has to be provider. So where does this have to happen? It has to start in patient access and or be finished at the time uh, the patient presents to the department. So most patient access now has integrated medical necessity and ABN is created. Electronic version of that is retained with the signature. Um, if you have further questions, I recommend the chapter 30, the limitation on liability and the internet only manual for Medicare. It goes through hundreds of pages of very explicit instructions with uh, examples. So the pre-service keys to success today are gonna be a registration. Demographics have to be accurate. And so therefore many uh, systems are focusing on a cell phone number. Um, a patient is less likely to give you an incorrect cell phone number than anything else. Um, you can always find them through the cell phone companies or what have you. So the cell phone number is important. Also, we're in an age where many people, uh, especially millennials and Generation X, they don't have a home phone. They have a cell phone and texts and what have you really work and validating. I know that if you, sometimes you get a validation request to validate your demographics. Um, asking probing questions. So I have a, a history of working in the ER and I'll listen to the registration people and they'll say, do you still live at 123 Smith Street? And the patient's gonna nod their head. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But they've moved five months before. Um, ensure the guardian is correct with the ability to change payers uh, multiple times a year. And in some states monthly, um, their insurer or guardian from the prior month may not be placed. So if you're gonna do a procedure, the first day of the, of the new month, make sure they're re-registered in total on that day because you may have different eligibility. And if you do, you may have different authorization requirements. Um, <clears throat> Ensure that the plan procedures have authorizations. And what I see as a frequent cause for failure is physicians' offices will get their authorization based on the CPT code they're going to perform. But the hospitals, they only get to present one CPT code. And that's the one that's going to be the, 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 the highest weighted. And they will not authorize anything else but the highest weighted. Well, if, for example, the physician decides that they're gonna do a different approach or something, and you know that ahead of time, the hospital needs a new authorization. The other thing is the authorizations are only good for the day and for which they are issued. So if you say the procedure is gonna happen on June 16th and it actually doesn't, you need a new auth. So meta getting all of this training and all of this into policies and procedures will really help you. We are seeing nationally between three and 23% of denials due to, due to just authorization, eligibility, and medical necessity. So when we're looking at charge capture, that's great. We wanna do that, but also we wanna make sure that you're not writing it off in the step one. So now we've gone through registration, admitting, and we're gonna start with looking in the clinical areas. And there are four things you can charge for. Procedures, which are generally coded by HIM. Services such as lab, radio, um, physiotherapy, things like that. That's 70,000 through 99,000 CPT range. And those are generally done by the charge master. So obviously charge master maintenance is essential here. Pharmacy also done by the charge master and usually a pharmacy system. So mapping becomes important. Today, we're gonna focus on supplies. Um, and that's in addition to room and board. In all cases, the CDM has to contain a line 
item for the charge. So sometimes we'll look at a claim and there'll be a CPT code, but there's no charge. For example, you needed a time charge in the OR, but that never charged, but you have a CPT code or codes for the procedure. If there's no charge on that 360, you're not gonna get reimbursed appropriately. Um, so it definitely you want to look and make sure that everything is working. When we're looking at charge capture 2021, I want to shift the focus. The focus used to be on missing charges, and now it is more on controlling the total costs associated with patient care. <clears throat> Many of these charges for supplies are not reimbursable, but the costs still exist. So if you're overutilizing your supplies and using more of them when it's not needed, or using the highest cost alternative, you're not gonna get that reimbursement back. So facilities are really looking at controlling practice patterns and supply chain to ensure the costs are addressed. So remember your charges minus costs is your revenue. So if your revenue is shrinking, yes, you may have missed the charges. And if you missed the charge and you never put the charge in and you're eligible for reimbursement on that charge, your cost still is on the books as soon as you use the item. So charges less cost is the revenue. Um, charges reviewed, we're gonna be looking for lost charges and over utilization pattern uh, for practice patterns and costs. And when I look at many of the major medical systems, they now have laboratory uh, utilization uh, of forms and they have lab utilization policies and procedures that prevent the, the doctors from ordering up anything they want. There has to be a specific reason why they're getting it. So instead of just getting a uh, comprehensive metabolic panel every morning on your patient, they're now saying, okay, well, get, if you have a renal patient, you need the BUN, you need the creatinine, you need the potassium and the sodium and don't get everything. Um, so we are seeing more and more cost utilization. We're actually seeing more and more in the supply chain and pharmacy. Um, so here's going back to um, 2019, but it was, it was the OPPS rule, and it's been in the rule ever since 2000. And it said that their reason for OPPS is packaging, and it encouraged hospitals to effectively negotiate with their manufacturers and suppliers to reduce the purchase price of items and explore alternative group purchasing. So since 2000, this mantra has been around. They also say similarly, package encouraged hospitals to establish protocols to ensure that necessity necessary items are furnished while scrutinizing the services ordered by practitioner to maximize the efficient use of hospital resources. Now what you're starting to see is vendor kiosks. As they come in the door, the vendor has to register what they're bringing in the building, for which doctor, why they're there. So there's an ongoing record of what's trying to be sold to the physician. Many departments now will determine best practice for uh, devices and which ones they're going to use. So they're not going to use every type of joint plant implant out there. They're going to go with a manufacturer for which they have a fairly good deal. So there are cost containment uh, going into play. When we're looking at today, we're going to focus on supply with the charge capture series. We're going to look at uh, individuals such as pharmacy, procedures, but today is just supplies. Um, they represent one of the largest percentage of the institution costs. Therefore, that's why I led into this with a large discussion on costs. They are, for the most part, not separately reimbursed, meaning you're not going to get specific money back for that item. You may get a percent of charge that pays for some of that. You may get some devices that get paid at 101% of cost. But as a general rule, most of your supplies don't get reimbursed separately. Um, we use supplies as an edit creation tool to look for missing procedures. So for example, if you use an electrophysiology catheter, mapping catheter, and you that's on the charges, but you don't have an EP study, then that's gonna point out that we may have loss of procedure. So I always get asked, what are these types of supplies? And the first one are the never chargeables. These are your equipment and DME. You cannot charge DME without a license. Um, Non-separately chargeable routine items, and we're gonna talk about that, and that goes back way into the 80s, 
um, with the beginning of DRG and some of our max. Um, separately chargeable items, but they're not reimbursable, meaning they're packaged, and separately chargeable items that are also reimbursable. So these are the four categories um, of the types of supplies. When we look at non-chargeable, these are DME usually. These are going to be cardiac monitors, lasers, neurologic monitoring equipment, pulse ox, managing the cost. So basically, not only the supply, so your pulse oximetry, if you have disposable tips, you're throwing it off between patients, that's routine and may be considered as part of the, of the wall monitor. Um, if it's being done individually, it might be something different, but we're looking at these items you can't charge equipment. So I always say, if you can plug it into an electrical outlet, it's not likely to be reimbursed. It's, it's all gonna be part of the cost report. Then we have these routine items, and this has always been a topic of great disparity. Never has there been any clarity for Medicare. Supplies generally used in the normal course of patient care, not specifically identifiable to a specific patient, and they generally lack an order. So since there was no true guidance, everybody for two decades has recalled the original Administar Federal, which was a, uh, a under the old thing before we had uh, Medicare administrative contractors, we had carriers and fiscal intermediaries, and this was one of the FISC people. Um, so that, that goes over two decades now. Um, generally, these have a low cost that are high volume, like admission kits, gauze, tape, bedpans, and the like. Uh, most facilities put the cost of these items into routine room and board or the visit expense. So those are gowns, gloves, scrapes, Microsoft covers, things like that. There are two bulletins out there that are still in use today, and they date back to February 12, 2012 for Administar. And uh, while they are no, pub no longer published, they are out there if you search the web. Um, basically, what they're saying routine by Administar, items used on most patients in the department for a procedure or service line. So basically, if it's going to be used on every single patient, um, getting a CT scan, then it's going to be routine. So these are gowns, gloves, drapes, oxygen, when it is not specifically ordered to a patient. Um, these items need to be rolled into the roommate and should not appear on the claim. The next category we have is separately chargeable, but they're low cost. Um, these chargeable supplies are directly used on a patient. They're not used on everybody. They're not routine. Therefore, these chargeable, but represent clutter in the charge capture process. A lot of times the staff focus on small items um, that, and then they, they forget to charge the big ones. So I went to one hospital where we saw Band-Aids and while they're separately identifiable, um, they just didn't, just didn't belong in the CDM. So it makes charge reconciliation completely unrealistic. You're trying to reconcile for those, those uh, charges that are gonna make a difference. Hospitals manage this process by having a low dollar threshold. So they have a policy and says, if it costs less than so many dollars, we're not gonna charge it separately and we're gonna roll it into the cost of the service. So this is where you start to see your OR levels, where they use a lot of low dollar, separately identifiable uh, items, but there's, they're rolled into the startup or the first 15 minutes of the OR. So these are ones where you need to have a low dollar threshold policy. Sometimes it's $5. I mean, I've seen it for a dollar. That makes no sense um, because what costs a dollar anymore? I mean, nothing. So I, I've seen the, the ones that are five still don't get the job done. We're usually looking at $25 or, or more. Anything that costs less than $25, because you know, prices in a hospital um, and from a medical supply is just ridiculously high. And so therefore a, 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 an appropriate threshold is required. Then we have the separately chargeable and they have to be used on a patient in the care of the patient, must represent a cost to the institution, um, use a revenue code, 270 through nine. Most are chargeable and considered covered, okay? So they're covered under the benefit, but they're not separately reimbursed. So there's a big difference. I hear a lot of times 
well, we charged it. Well, it's covered service. You just don't get paid separately for it. So these items have a huge impact on revenue and can be made into edits that detect when a procedure or service is missing. So this is kind of the group. This and that, that is separately chargeable and reimbursable. Those two categories, we want to start writing edits for it. You can use Epic Revenue Guardian, some of your other uh, pre-claim edits, uh, Vital where uh, Health Catalyst has a vital integrity. So there's a lot of ways to get this, this one in. The separately chargeable are usually coded. And when we're doing separately chargeable, um, most coding group doesn't do this. But what we want to know when coding a supply are several factors. The supply chain should have the vendor, the model number, the vendor advice or FDA advice, and the UNSPC number on file for every single item. Um, a UNSPC we're going to cover in a minute, but this helps you, and even you, if you use software or you can go out the vendor website, it helps you to determine what's the best code. So I always see CDM people putting in codes that they believe are correct, but when you go to the vendor website or the FDA, they have actually got a more specific code, which helps in the process. UNSPC is a supply item thing started by the United Nations. It's called the United Nations Standard Product and Services Code. It is a taxonomy code. It is not specific to every single supply item. It is a, a, it's a categorization process. It completes with, it does compete with other systems internationally. So this is not the only uh, categorization process. So there are different ones out there. It uses four tiers and eight digit coding mechanisms. So the tiers are the segment, the family, the class, and the commodity. And if you look at these tiers, it, it just really, if you ever took biology uh, and the classification of plants and animals and species, this very much looks the same. It has each tier starts with uh, two digits and they can be zero, zero. So for example, we're going to use one for pen refills. This is the UNSPC, it starts with office equipment, then it goes to office supplies, which brings it down more into the genre level, ink and lead refills, which might be your species, and then pen refills is the type of species. So um, you can add it for business functions. So this is a real simple one. But when I go to the next one, here's cardiac pacemakers. They start off with a segment, which is medical equipment and supplies. They then go to diagnostic imaging and nuclear medicine products. Um, and they look at the class, which is pacemaker and related products. Okay, now people will say, these are not diagnostic imaging or nuclear medicine. Why is it in that family name? Because actually if that family is the only family under that equipment and access to supplies that has been made for uh, for multitude of devices. So when we look at cardiac pacemakers as the class name, you'll look that the last two digits of the class name, uh, the class up top is zero, zero, but going below it's a one, oh, two, oh, three. And it actually then spells it right down to the type uh, of the pacemaker. So when reviewing your supplies in CDM, UNSPC is usually helpful. And you can look it up pretty quickly using UNSPC at just a multitude of sites that are out there. So when we're looking at this, we want to look at charge capture concerns. And in many instances, the supply code that's assigned is inaccurate. So if you're trying to build edits, which we're going to talk about in the future for reimbursement, and the supply code is wrong, the cost is going to be there, no matter if the supply code is wrong. The reimbursement of that or the allowable cost of that can, can be changed. So it's very, very important that supply coding be as accurate as a procedure. So supply chain should reach out to CDM management for the most appropriate kind. Um, for example, a supply of an atherectomy catheter is coded as an electrophysiology catheter. These are actual examples we looked at, you know, where for whatever reason, the atherectomy catheter uh, the catheter was charged as an EP catheter, 
in the charging system, but the code on it was for an atherectomy catheter, which is entirely different. So the edit was based on C1730, looks for this missing EP study because it was done with that and it created a false positive because it's atherectomy. Um, revenue codes, people say they don't matter. They actually do. Um, your revenue codes are set up by CMS um, to, and, and to actually and the American Hospital Association to provide guidance for roll-ups on the cost report. So they do matter a lot. So for example, you use 361 for every minor procedure. What is that actually doing? That's diluting your 360 uh, for OR procedures. Maybe uh, treatment room 761 would be a better choice. So revenue codes absolutely matter. We have sterile supply 272, and it may or may not have a Hicks fix code. We have pacemaker 275, they have to have a Hicks fix code. We have uh, interocular lenses, 276. They have to have a Hicks fix code. Implants, 278. Now, 278 has just been really confusing for about a decade now. Way back in the day in New York, uh, Blue Cross said anything that goes in the body uh, could be an implant. So all of a sudden, we start to see IV catheters, Foley catheters, uh, drainage tubes being implants. Well, Nubix said, you know, we, we're going to have to do something. And Nubix, the American Hospital Association that runs the uh, revenue codes, uh, we're going to have to come up with a different definition. And initially, they said, well, it has to stay in the body for the length of the uh, device, you know, lifetime. And then they said, you know what, I guess that's not true because we have plenty of stents that go in, like urologic stents that are actually implants but they're passed out through the body in, in a very short time period. So they said, well, examples are devices, implants, or joint replacement screws and anchors. So not IV catheters, not Foley catheters, uh, they're 272. So when I'm looking at these risks area, where are my high costs? Obviously OR. Um, they're run by preference cards that may or may not be as maintained as they should be. Pick list might be outdated. Uh, late charges are common. Um, it's important to compare the impact log to the coded implant. Um, is that correct? And that's one way of finding these lost charges very quickly. Edits between devices and procedures are a great litmus test to ensure the coding of supply and procedure matches. Now, what's wrong with the OR? Why am I pointing this out? Operating room services, and to some degree, Endo and Cath Lab do the same thing, but not always. Um, but operating room services, what happens is they charge the entire uh, pick list. And then at the end of the case, what's not used, nursing services will go and credit that or take it off the pick list is not used, or a charge entry person. So they charge by exception. So everything is being charged, it's just the exception. The problem is, since these pick lists are used, or preference cards to a specific physician, the physician might swap out a catheter, the preference card and pick list is not updated, and so therefore you're charging the wrong catheter or you're not charging it at all. So this charging by exclusion, which is mandatory, because otherwise the OR would never get the charging done due to the volume, is also fraught with, with failures. Another area we see all the time are just coding errors left and right in cardiology. There are two different cardiology groups. One are elect electricians, and there one is plumbers. The electrician is electrophysiology with specific mapping catheters, ablation catheters, pacemakers. So they may have one set up and charge slip. The plumbers are interventional diagnostic cardiology, PTCA, and atherectomy. So one is dealing with the electrical conduction of the heart, and the other set of people are dealing with the conduit, being the veins, arteries, and chambers of the heart. These make it easier to start doing um, to start doing your uh, your charge capture process. 
Um, revenue code is 272 is generally assigned revenue code for catheters, but pacemakers come under 275 for which pacemaker specific. There has been a time where in fact, I have seen um, catheters being coded as 278 um, because there's a stent on the end. You code the stent, you don't code the catheter or you code them separately. The other issue with cardiology is they use kits and you have to code every item in the kit, not just the kit as a total. Same thing for the OR and endo. You need to be able to code everything individually some of it will be billable, some of it will be not billable. But if you only pick the code that's on the kit, you're going to be missing some of those items. Um, another area we see lost charges is the misconception of what DME is and what it is not. DME requires a special provider license, but prost prosthetics and orthotics do not. They are actually reimbursed by a carrier or MAC under revenue code 274. And these are on the, the provider DME POS fee schedule. And they're assigned a designation of PO for prosthetics and orthotics. So you can go right down the list of that and just pull out the POs and have every single Hicks fix code you need. So examples of frequently lost IFC knee splints, walking boots under 272 or 270, and they need 274. Also, there's usually an L Hix fix code that's on the box. So when doing that, you look at that. So here's a screenshot of the DME fee schedule. And if you look at the red arrows down here, you're gonna see that the prosthetics and orthotic are in fact listed out. They're charged by the facility based on the L code that best describes them. And they are, there is uh, charges, reimbursement charges. And if you look, all of these were L codes. If you look down all these POs, they were L codes. So Hicks picks assignment key are keys to success. Supply coding for accurate reimbursement. Which category of supply is it? Is it routine? Is it non-separately billable? Is it separately billable, but such low cost that you want to roll it in or separately billable where you want to put it on the claim itself? Put those low dollar supplies in a low dollar threshold. The more you bundle this stuff, the better off you are, but keep track of what's in the bundle because the bundle will change from time to time. And it's at, you need to do cost accounting to make sure that you raise your prices or decrease your prices accordingly. Ensure you're charging with hard uh, uh, coded or uncoded Hicks fix line for all separately identifiable items. Those are ones that have an order and can be seen the patient, not low dollar threshold. Prosthetics and orthotics should be correctly coded and billed. Uh, note inaccurate edits, and we're going to talk about edits in a moment. Just, just identify uh, er erroneous coded. So if the supply is right and you're missing the procedure and that edit catches that, then you have caught a procedure. So that's a lot more uh, reimbursement than a supply. And this needs to be a team approach. So all of this is culminating into thinking about edits. What can I match X as a trigger and Y as a target? What can I do where if I have a trigger on the claim, I'm looking for the target and vice versa? So when we think at it, the purpose of supply it is to minimize revenue leakage by ensuring the coding is correct of the supply, identifying missed supplies that are common to a procedure, not common to AA procedure, that would be my typo, vice versa, uh, procedures where supply is used. Um, I have had inordinate number of examples where the o OR record talks about the insertion of a dual chamber pacemaker and because there was a pick list it was a charged out as a single chamber so we look at that here's an example of a missing dissector the supply was triggered by the procedure um, which was coded by HIM but the, I, there's no way possible they did the procedure without a dissector so the supply is actually missing on this one. Um, here's what it was looking for. I needed C1727, which is the dissector, but that was not on the claim. So that is a lost charge. 
Another example is if you look at the facility SAF documentation for repair of incisional hernias and implantation of mesh, it's impossible to do those procedures without the mesh, C1781. So if I have a mesh on the bill, the C1781, I better have some mesh procedure also on the bill. So mapping these procedures to a supply is very useful. Um, here's another one in this set of uh, implantation of the mesh. We know the C1781 was not charged. So what's the reason for that? Now we start looking at root cause. Is it a late charge, which happens all the time? And then by reviewing these edits, you can start to figure out who's got late charges and where they're occurring. Failed to charge it at all due to a pick list, or maybe it was an add-on item that wasn't on a pick list and forgot to be charged separately. Preference card didn't have it for this surgeon. They used another preference card. Any multitude of reasons could have caused this, but the key here is it was missing. So edits for identification, um, I don't know why this is upside down, but it is. Um, I apologize for that. Um, we'll fix that before we send it out. Here's an atherectomy device and it needed one of these two things. So this is targets and triggers. Um, and I don't know why I didn't catch that. I do apologize, but here would be any with and without. And so we will show you this in the next thing. So when I use the software in the literature for accurate coding, I am looking in the record and it says it's a Medtronic Silverhawk model P4034. Now that's very specific. It has a UNSPC code. It has a model number. It has a manufacturer and it has a model name. So I've got everything I need for correct coding. So if I go out there to the site for Medtronics, it tells me it can be either C1714 or C1724, depending on the specific thing. In this case, it was a directional C1714. So we look, Here's another where we're looking it up by manufacturer. You have the, the manufacturer model number, the UNSPC number, and then the HixPix code that it wants. And so when you have all that information in your supply master, it makes it very easy to ensure coding is correct. Once you get your supply coding correct, and you get the C1714, then it's gonna trigger the appropriate procedure. But if you didn't have the C1714, you had something else, it's gonna look for a different procedure. So outside vendors, you can create it internally, but there's also software available from vendors to do this. And one of the benefits is while internally you struggle, you have to use audits or some mechanism, some uh, a number of edits, claim edits that you've created, they're never quite comprehensive. Um, and outside, they have hundreds to millions of rules um, that consume 100% of the charges every day. So they're easy to spot. Um, the output uh, provides work cues, so your patterns of behavior show up. And when they show up, it allows you to then get a workforce together and do your root cause remediation. So. I want to point out, I usually get, well, PFS has edits. Right, they do. But PFS is not, it, it, not editing for what's missing. It's editing for what is on the claim and does that make sense? But it never catches things you miss. So it's very important during charge capture, prior to sending it over to claim creation, that you have all the charges so when the edits appear, their edits are there appropriately. So I always get this thing, I'm not gonna worry about it because PSF and our scrubber has edits, but they're not looking for what's missing, they're only looking for what's there. And one of the things that this would also do is look at the quantity. So a lot of times I will see on the charges, a charge and a credit, a charge and a credit. And there's like, this happens like four times because there was some sort of problem. And then ultimately what happens is it didn't get on at all because there were too many credits for the charge. So this will catch that. 
So when we go to uh, the key to charge capture success is your team. Supply chain has to be a, a standard member of the team. CDM, HIM coding, operating room has to be part of it. Personnel who can write or manage edits. So that's usually IT. So you give them everything they need and they write the edit. Revenue integrity team, their goal is to focus on root cause identification and remediation. So without these, you don't get there. You need policies and procedures. I can tell you the number of times I've, all, I've heard, we've always done it that way. And I will say, where is it written down? <coughs> Oh, it isn't because we've always done it that way. And then you go to another person that started a couple months ago and you say, what do you do? I don't know. I have to go ask Sue or Tom and, and find out what they did. So it's all the worst possible scenario. It's all by uh, verbal report and it's up to interpretation. So policies and procedures are key. We have to have what constitutes a non-routine or stock item. <clears throat> what constitutes chargeable supplies? What the low dollar threshold policy is? Individually identifiable. Devices and implants, how they get charged. Because remember, a lot of your devices and implants are in purchase orders. So they're built on consignment. So you have to wait for the purchase order. What's that going to look like? What's that process look like? How do we know if we didn't get the PO? Did the claim go out the door without it? Orthotics and prosthetic, making sure that the vendors have on the boxes the L codes that they've been told by CMS. So policies are helpful in working with the commercial payers too and your percentage charge accounts because, you know, quite frankly, their goal with their field auditors is to take those percent of charges and whittle it down. So they're not paying you or reimbursing you as much. And where do they focus? They focus in supplies saying, oh, that should have been part of the procedure or you shouldn't have built that separately. When you have policies and procedures that you can show them and it's not written in their contract of how it's gonna be charged, you have the upper hand. So it's very, very important with your percentage of charge accounts that you have these policies and procedures be able to deploy them when you have a field auditor uh, that you're gonna challenge. Whenever possible, site source authority, CMS, the Medicare Administrative Contractor or payer guideline. I know that most of the payers say we follow Medicare, except when it's not convenient for us. And then we have a different guideline. So when you're trying to look at charge capture processes and, and Blue Cross or your top five payers have different payer guidelines and how they reimburse that, that has to go into the policy. So you make sure that the charge capture is set up to meet those requirements. So for example, um, this is not a supply issue, this is an E&M level. Medicare says you make up your own uh, level for ER uh, charges, levels. However, Humana is very specific in what they will allow in the levels. So who do you're gonna default? You're gonna have to default to Humana because that's the more restrictive. Um, I also look at OR maintenance procedures for supply chain. How often are the pick lists updated? So what I usually get is, well, when we installed the system, we did it. Okay, well, your system has been through seven iterations of upgrades. That's a decade ago. You know, what are we talking about? Every preference card and pick list needs to be go, going through on every case. So basically, you're going to review them as you use them and make sure they're all correct. Daily charge review is the most important piece of this. Um, and if you can't do 100% if you're doing manual, but you can do 100% if you're software, you, but you're really looking for patterns of behavior. Do I have a department with late charges? So every Friday in the OR, I'm not going to get any charge capture until Monday. Oh, by the way, I'm on a three-day min hold. So it's going out the door Monday and I may have lost my charges. Missing tandem supplies such as diagnostic cardiovascular catheter, but no sheets. Uh, for procedures that consistently miss supply, is there an outdated charge slip? Is there outdated order entry system? So the goal is to look for identified patterns. You will make yourself nuts on the one-off. 
But basically, you want to identify patterns, determine root cause, and remediate whatever concern you find out. And so when I close out today, and we will have time for questions, uh, the largest group of late charges is, in fact, supplies. By far, bar none, it's the largest group. Frequently overlooked due to maintenance concerns or OR pick lists and preference cards. So when you talk to supply chain, they'll say, I have it coded right. But yeah, that's only one of the steps in charging a supply. Where else did you do it? Did you do it on the floor? Is it in a different system? Um, is it in a PIXIS or a cabinet? Supply coding is generally not done by certified coders, and that can have an impact on the claim. Requires 100% daily review of these, if possible, and can be very impactful when making your edits. Um, so at this point, Marie, we're going to do questions. Marie? I guess she's gone uh, mute on me. So Laura, do I have any regulatory data to support the billing of implants that were attempted during a surgical procedure being implanted? It's just stent screws, definitely not ones that are dropped on the floor, open, but not used. If in fact it is documented that you started with it and then you had to use something else, most payers, including Medicare, will accept that. Um, it depends on your contracts with the commercials. Many commercial payers will actually say that the device that was, was left in the body or was ultimately inserted is the only one you can charge for. Um, but you will have to look at your payer guidelines for this one as they're much more specific than Medicare. When there is a Medicare device dependent procedure, it's gonna be difficult to get two devices on there. Um, but you, as long as it's actually written why it was not that you tried to do it and it didn't meet the potty or it didn't meet the anatomy or there was a reason, um, but stents and screws and rods, all of those have to actually be tried in the body. And what I see a lot of times with the stents is they don't deploy it um, at all. So there's a, a, a lot of different things. Anonymous, without a DME license, DMA won't be paid. Is there any harm in posting charges for them? Yes, there is. You are not to be charging for DME without a license. You would need a statistical charge with absolutely no money on it whatsoever to be able to track that. I wholly recommend that this never goes near the charge master and that the entire DME charging is maintained within the supply chain. And because this may or may not be an allowable cost for you on your cost report. So you need to get with your cost report people and determine if it's going to be allowable. And then if it's an allowable cost, how are you going to quantify those um, for yourself? But because you have the option of, of getting a DME vendor and you choose not to, then that brings into a different story versus one isn't available to you or won't because you're low volume, they won't do it. Remember, some DME uh, is made by an outside DME provider, but they are put on to a Part A or inpatient claim um, as part of a surgery. So they bill the hospital, and the hospital is then required to put the DME item onto the claim. So it's not an all or none theory. You have to look at what's being provided and how it's being provided. If it's part of a surgical procedure, then they're gonna send you an invite. You've been instructed by Medicare to put it on the claim. If it is in fact just outpatient DME, like you're gonna give out canes and crutches, and you know you're gonna do this, and you don't wanna bill for them, then what you can do is make them an asset of the hospital, and uh, you'll have to get a lawyer for this, asset of the hospital, and the patient will have to sign that, um, these are assets of the hospital and not returned in a certain period of time. Uh, there may be a charging capture. So this becomes legal at that point. I'm not a lawyer, so I really can't give you sound advice on that one. Um, okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I, I wasn't on mute, but it wasn't going through for some reason. So we have a couple of questions actually coming through on the chat panel. 
Um, please make sure that you type them into the Q&A panel because the chat panel does not record the questions for us. Um, so here's one, Bill. I work in radiology and we don't use a pick list, but would charge list for procedures be useful? So, yeah, I mean, interventional radiology uses the same things. So you may be using a cell ginger, a POTS needle to get in. You may be using a guide wire. You may be using a diagnostic J cath, whatever it is. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, it's okay to have a charge list. And many hospitals put a uh, charge list that explodes with the uh, procedure. Uh, for the basic stuff, and then you add on the stuff that would be specific to the patient, like the, the diagnostic JCAT, um, you know, but you've got your, you could charge for your contrast and everything that can be on the pick list. So yeah, you can make one, but make sure it's ones that you're going to always use. Um, if there's going to be some variability in it, then I would charge that extra. Great. Um, one more thing came through the Q and A. Would you please repeat what you said regarding crutches given to a patient by the hospital? So crutches are DME. Um, most people have a DME cabinet for PT and for ER. And there is a DME form on it. The, the physician has to write a prescription. That prescription and the charge form is stapled together the crutches are dispensed from that cabinet that is owned by the DME company. And then that prescription and that charge capture sheet goes to the DME company and they bill the patient. For crutches if, and, and, and canes that you're not, don't have a DME provider, then I have seen in some rural areas where they make it, um, they basically make it an asset of the hospital and then they have a lawyer that has figured out a way to, uh, to, to charge it. The problem is that becomes cost shifting and that's really going to be a problem with Medicare. What most people do do in that case is they basically, a physician gives them a prescription and they can go to CVS, Walgreens or any Walmart or any other provider of the services and, and get it there and have it covered by that insurance. So, uh, we don't recommend that asset thing, um, but it, the best way to do a DME is to have a DME cabinet. So that's going to be some orthotics that are not listed as prosthetics in orthotics. Um, that's going to be some of your canes, your clutches, your wheelchairs, your uh, raised toilet seats, all of those things. Um, some of them are in big cabinets or supply room. And then you fill that out with the prescription. There has to be a diagnosis code. Uh, the physician signs it and attached it goes back. Um, DME company makes a prosthetic device for a patient post-surgery. So I, I can't actually give you the answer to that because there's a timing involved. If it is directly related to the surgery and within the billing cycle of the inpatient claim, it has to go on the claim. What Medicare has basically said and the OIG has found in audits is that people were getting DME the day after they were discharged as a routine pattern. And they said that that would not fly. So basically, this has to be up to the DME company on who they bill. If the DME company wants to bill the hospital, then it must go on the inpatient claim. Um, but it's impossible to create charges after discharge. So there, this becomes a legal nightmare. Who's going to bill it? In some states, uh, the MAC will be helpful. In others, they will not. Um, the commercial payers, however, usually have a very strong feeling about this. And they want the claim to come from the DME company directly um, because they basically are going to negotiate with that DME company for a reimbursement price. So it's really something you need to work with your DME provider to find out what, what the best answer is. What else, Marie? That's all we that we have right now. That's left. Well, that's it. That's it, uh, yeah. We yeah. appreciate your time today. I apologize for standing on my head on that one slide and doing it upside down. When Marie sends it out today, we will have 
hopefully flip that over. So uh, uh, I do apologize for that. Thank you for being part of it. We are going to do three more sessions on charge capture. So we hope you'll join us in the future um, for future uh, charge capture. And Marie, we just got a hand raise. Is there anything else? Uh, nope, just a lot of thank yous and great presentations. And that's pretty much all. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.